And as a way to perhaps begin our, our uh, conversation, a bit of, of history uh, for, for those audience members who don't know much about uh, international organizations, tell us how they, they came to be, these international organizations. Sure, and I cover this a little bit in the book, uh, but there's lots of histories, of course, of international organizations, and most people start with the 19th century conferences, where uh, lawyers got together from different countries to do various treaty-making efforts. And the 19th century conferences led to a certain hindrances. States found that they were at the, at the basically the, the, uh, the rule of the host state who decided whom to invite, what issues to put on the agenda. And therefore, there was lack of continuity with, with respect to addressing global issues. If, some, if the host state didn't want to inv uh, invite a state that they didn't get along with, they weren't there. So the deficiencies with these 19th century conferences led states to think about creating uh, viable institutions with international secretariats uh, where, where uh, uh, over time uh, these institutions would have universal or at least aspire to have universal membership. And among the first was the International Labor Organization mm -hmm. in 1919 and then of course the League of Nations. So, uh, so those were some of the earlier efforts uh, to establish international organizations. And I think that most people explain them in terms of what I call functionalism. Functionalism. That is what political scientists would describe as states need to cooperate uh, at a certain level. And the best work on this, I think, is done by perfectly political scientists paired with a lawyer, Duncan uh, Snydell and Abbott. And they, they explain it in terms of the of state's need for centralization and independence. They need to centralize their efforts mm -hmm. with respect to resources uh, or uh, financial as well as intellectual resources uh, to engage together in a problem because more minds in one place are better. But also the need for independence, mm -hmm. the need for an institution like the ICJ or the independent civil service of the UN Secretary General, uh, some third party who is at the relative remove from state's interests who can, for example, settle a dispute neutrally or allocate resources neutrally. Um, and so th that desire for centralization and independence I think is a good explanation for why international organizations came into being. And, and, and why did this uh, need emerge in the uh, late 19th century? Why the late 19th century? Well, a lot of the explanations, including by political scientists today, turn on globalization. Uh, the, the increased interde interdependence of states, not just on economic issues, but on lots of other issues. Uh, also, the need to resolve global, uh, common global problems mm -hmm. or the global commons, for example. Uh, and that started to emerge much more forcefully the more interactions among states In occurred. the late 19th century. In the late 19th century, as capital, goods, ideas, uh, cross boundaries, then states had to engage with one another in order to resolve, for example, how free trade was going to be conducted. And of course, all of this started happening uh, in the great maritime area, as Grotius himself mm -hmm. discovered. But at that time, it was limited to the high seas, for example. But now, states relate to each other on every level, from culture mm -hmm. to economics. And so the need for international organizations uh, as one place where they can resolve common difficulties mm -hmm. is now inevitable. And, and, and this need, which appeared in the late 19th century and developed uh, throughout the, the 20s and 30s, grew even stronger in the aftermath of, 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 of World War II. Right. And so what I cover in my book, but is also a part of the literature, is the different stages of international organizations, including especially the UN. So the UN, which is, of course, a successor to the League of Nations, uh, is itself a, a something that we see in other organizations. That is, organizations tend to be established by learning from the prior mm -hmm. efforts. So they are efforts to correct the past. So what is the UN Charter? The UN Charter stands as a sort of backwards-looking document to correct the perceived flaws of the League of Nations Charter. What were those flaws? Well, the lack of a collective security arm, the lack of a clear binding obligation not to use force, the lack of what I would call institutional separation of powers, so that uh, now in the UN we have a, a Security Council, 
that is charged with primary obligations of, of peace and security, whereas the General Assembly is a talk shop for almost every other issue, and then the ICJ has its own domain. Mm -hmm. Uh, all of that, uh, along with things like the duty to pay, du uh, the duty to pay dues, um, the um, lack of a withdrawal clause, so you don't suffer from what the League of Nations suffered from, where Japan just left yeah. <laughs> when it when it wanted to. All of those are demonstrations of how the UN learned from its prior mistakes. But over time, the UN has learned from its own mistakes yes. or its own dilemmas so that the UN uh, had to undergo de the colonization, which was its own efforts to produce more states, but that was a radical shift in, for example, the composition of the General Assembly, mm -hmm. uh, which went from a, a body that was under the control effectively of the United States and some Western powers to a body that now exceeds 190 states. And of course, the UN, uh, the US has no control yes. over a majority mm -hmm. necessarily. Mm -hmm. That's a big change. Mm -hmm. So decolonization was a big change. The other started, of course, in the, in the in 1940s, uh, late 1940s, 50s, and 60s, the Cold War which paralyzed a lot of the institutions, not just the UN, but certainly the Security Council, was unable to achieve consensus or even uh, achieve any kind of action uh, with very little exceptions. Um, and then the next period would have been post-Cold War when things changed again. Precisely, so you just described for us what happened in the uh, late 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, would you say that uh, the, the post-Cold War era, uh, the 90s and the 2000s, uh, introduced qualitative change in the, in the nature of the organization and the work of the organization? Absolutely, and I think in the immediate wake of the Cold War, there was uh, what some people have called UN euphoria, uh, the New World Order that even uh, the first President Bush talked about, or certainly Secretary uh, General um, uh, Kofi Annan stressed in his agenda for peace, a sense that things were now completely changed, that the UN could work as intended. And the epitome of that, for many people, was getting uh, Iraq out of Kuwait. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a victory for how the UN Charter could work as intended. And people thought, and I think naively, that that would be the model for the future that in the future aggression could be stopped because there would be no exercise of the veto. Uh, peacekeeping would become robust, aggressive. States would actually perhaps contribute peacekeeping forces under regular arrangements like Article 47 originally intended. That post-Cold War euphoria ended in part because of uh, U.S. having second thoughts post-Somalia, for example. And as we all know, uh, we've entered a period uh, beyond that where, yes, the Cold War is over, but nobody really expects the veto to be over. Mm -hmm. um, and so states use the veto, or they don't need to. That is, it's clear that action will not come forward. And so I think that we're in a new mode. Some people would describe post-9-11 mode as one of them. I am doubtful that uh, the, the forms of terrorism that we saw from post 9-11 radically changed the organization, mm -hmm. except that, of course, some governments, especially the Bush administration in the United States, might have thought uh, that that was a new paradigm shift. I think um, we're in a different era than the immediate post-Cold War era, but I can't yet put a label on it. Yes, because in fact uh, the, the 90s have been very, very eventful in terms of operations, in terms of uh, normative ev evolution, legal evolution, and it seems that the, the 2000s have been quite uh, relatively quiet. Right, but, uh, but even then you would see some people describing the recent events with respect to Libya as the reactivation of the responsibility to protect. A new sense that states really do have a responsibility to protect their populations and that the UN could authorize what some would have called humanitarian intervention. But you don't believe in this? I am very doubtful yes. about this. Although the language of the Libyan resolution harkens back mm -hmm. to responsibility to protect, I suspect that, they, that the Security Council will not act consistently on that premise. So, so that maybe Syria, they won't do it. Probably or, not. Uh, probably not. And therefore, I have doubts that the responsibility to protect is anything other than a politically 
useful tool when convenient, but not a legal principle that we can expect to be consistently applied. So Libya is an exception rather than the triggering of a new... Right. And I, and I myself have some doubts about the wisdom or perhaps even the legality of the Libyan operation. I mean, I have no doubt that the Security Council can authorize this. Mm -hmm. uh, the questions I would have is whether the authorization to use force is ultimately to the benefit of the civilians on the ground. Mm -hmm. Whenever you use force, civilians are killed. And some would argue, and I am no Libyan expert, that uh, Gaddafi didn't really intend to kill everybody in that town, as we claimed. He said he would, but was that just bragging rights mm -hmm. that he had? Still, I, I understand why uh, NATO acted. I am nervous, though, about a, a Security Council resolution that says you're supposed to act only uh, for, uh, to protect civilians mm -hmm. and yet is anticipating the use of force and also says no, no uh, military occupation. Mm -hmm. Why does it make you nervous? Because I'm not sure what it says, what it means to say protect civilians only this far and so that you have then what I consider not surprising, given the compromises in the resolution, divisions among NATO as to what is meant, what kind of force, the extent of force, who's responsible, uh, when does it end, do we permit uh, Gaddafi to stay in power, is the real aim to remove him from power, as I think the United States has suggested, although not under the resolution. And but, this but, is crucially important. But if we had answered all these questions, it is quite probable that the resolution wouldn't have been voted. Well, but I think the problem is that when you authorize force, uh, one of the basic things, and this goes back to, say, Colin Powell in the United States, you better know what your mandate is because people's lives are on the ground. So of all things, you better be clear on what it is you're trying to achieve. Are you trying to remove somebody from power or just protect civilians? Have an end plan in place. Uh, and here, uh, if you wound Gaddafi, but you don't yes. remove him from power, that's not exactly a good plan. Yes. So, uh, yes, we expect a lot from people who authorize force, and I think we should. And you don't see a similar thing happening for Syria? No, and, and, and that's, nor, should it, should it, nor should I, nor yes. should it. Yes. That is, I don't think, uh, I do think that the UN drafters intended the Security Council to act for political reasons. And I don't think they, they anticipated that it would always act consistently over time. Uh, although, of course, what some of the things that the Security Council does has a legal impact. Yeah. Just to go back to some of the themes uh, which are at the core of your work on international organizations, I mean, it seems that uh, global governance has become a, a, a central notion uh, when talking about uh, international affairs and, uh, and the management of, of the international system. So first of all, do you feel that uh, such a notion, which is quite vague and ambiguous, uh, is appropriate? And, uh, and uh, do you think that it can be uh, used appropriately as a way to describe what is the role of international institutions in terms of managing the international system? Governance is vague, but I do think we need some term to describe what is going on that is not government. That is, we all know what a government is. It's a nation state that has the control over law, the use of force within its own territory. And it has a territory, and uh, it has courts, it has legislatures, it has police, etc. We don't have world government. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we will ever have world government absent a uh, alien invasion, and I mean from aliens. Yes. Uh, and therefore, I think what we do have to describe, though, is these interrelationships among states and international organizations and hybrid institutions and businesses and NGOs, a variety of non-state actors, in other words, that are now affecting how states behave even inside their own country. That, for lack of another term, is governance, yes. right? And I do think that that's the term political scientists like Bob Cohane and Joseph Nye describe. It is also the term that my own university uh, people here like Benedict Kingsbury yes. and Richard Stewart describe when they describe global administrative law. So what they're talking about is forms of regulation 
that happened across the board. And I'm not just talking about international organizations. They're not just talking about international organizations. Of course, what the World Bank does, what the IMF does, some of the things UN bodies do can be described as global administrative law. But they're also talking about the effects of business regulation among businesses, private to private regulation that has an impact on whether a particular good crosses a border. How the internet is governed mm -hmm. is not something that an international organization classically understood does. So hybrid private institutions are also now having a governance effect. Mm -hmm. Now there are different ways of describing it. You can describe this as some political scientists do as network effects, systems analysis, global administrative law. Some people describe it as forms of constitutionalism, mm -hmm. especially when you have international courts involved in interpreting this. Um, others, uh, for example, Rob, uh, Rob House at my institution, along with Rudy Titel, describe what international courts do vis-a-vis -vis each other as the rise of humanities law, suggesting that now what we see, at least when international judges in the ICJ, the ad hoc tribunals, human rights bodies, when they engage in cases, they increasingly talk to each other in human rights terms. Mm -hmm. So they're seeing signs of human rights language and themes and even norms in trade, in investment disputes, and in human rights and in international criminal law. So, you, so, so, so clearly you, you, you are telling us that, uh, the con first of all, global governance uh, corresponds to something which is real. Uh, it, 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 uh, it corresponds to a need which has to be uh, uh, filled. And, and you, you, you feel that international organizations are really playing a strategic role uh, in this arena of global governance. Right. And they are they not being marginalized. I mean, you know, in well, no, I think they're part of the picture. Mm -hmm. It used to be that you would say states and international organizations are the only actors engaged in international lawmaking or norm making. I think the picture is much more complicated yeah. today. I do believe that states are still the primary lawmakers for themselves as well as for their own peoples, and that international organizations still remain probably the second most mm. important. But now there are lots of other players. So multinational corporations are players. International judges individually are players. Individuals who bring disputes before uh, uh, the uh, regional human rights courts can influence the law in all of Europe uh, by the claims they bring. Or an investor in investor state dispute settlement in ICSID under the World Bank can change the law, not just under a particular treaty, but perhaps even more globally through the impact of an arbitration award. All of these are new actors. Some of them are not states. Yes. Uh, and therefore, if we didn't have a term like governance, we'd have to invent something else mm -hmm. to describe these very different complex legal effects. Precisely, you know, I was going to ask you, I mean, is a global governance enough for the needs that we have at the global level? More and more you, you, you begin to hear the, the notion of global policy, of global public policy. In fact, uh, uh, the uh, European Union itself is an exercise of global, of global policy at the regional level. I mean, does it make sense to, to think that perhaps global governance is not uh, thick enough, is not uh, really fulfilling all the needs that we have, and, and beyond global governance we should think about global public policy, and if it is the case, then, uh, you know, what would be, what should be the role of international institutions in this evolving landscape? Right, and, and here I guess the only, I'm open to very many different configurations of what should take place, but I am skeptical of the claim that international organizations, classically understood to be interstate organizations organized under a treaty like the UN system, have to be made more powerful in order to deal with the challenges you describe. The world that I see is a world in which, for lack of other uh, desires to make international organizations the actors, are reaching to many different approaches. Mm -hmm. So it's a mix of different and rather eclectic approaches for exercising both lawmaking and policy, as you describe it. Yes. Um, and I'm not so sure that's so bad. That is, I don't think uh, that we necessarily want or need one single all-powerful international organization mm -hmm. or in the world of courts, one single all-powerful hierarchical court. 
but, but do you feel that there is indeed uh, a, a need to go one step uh, further, one step higher in terms of uh, uh, institutionalizing uh, uh, the, the, the sense of shared vulnerability, what we could call shared vulnerability? And do you think that this idea of, 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 of policy at the global level makes sense? I mean, you know, we, we hear this all the time in terms of trying to tackle issues having to do with development, with the environment, and clearly the, the, the way things are working at the moment are not really very functional. So, first of all, do you think that it is a, a I, sensible idea? And if it is the case, then what would be? Right. Uh, I think that with respect to certain global commons, um, where it is clear that you cannot resolve it at the regional level, but you need the cooperation of every state from the U.S. to China to resolve something like uh, climate change, yes. then I think you de facto need a universal uh, approach, whether that is a universal treaty or a series of them, whether it requires an international organization to preside over the treaty, I'm less sure about. Mm -hmm. But I have no doubt that every major player should be in the room. But there are some issues that are more regional in focus. And I, for one, have been in my own scholarship skeptical of, for example, the idea that international criminal uh, problems should always be resolved at the international level. That I think that you are skeptical about. I'm skeptical yes. about that. That is, even though I'm an advisor yes, to the prosecutor absolutely. of the International yes. Criminal Court, mm -hmm. I strongly believe in that court's complementarity regime, mm -hmm. which effectively says that the International Criminal Court is the last resort not the first resort. The perfect solution would be for the jurisdictions that are most closely involved, whether because it's the nation where the perpetrator is or where the crime was committed, for example, those nations should ideally be the ones to adjudicate the perpetrator and, and criminalize the process. Because I think um, the closer you are to the crime, Mm -hmm. the closer you are to having an impact but on all the issues that you want. But the, the closer you are, you mean at the national level, at, at the, the regional national. level? Because at the national yeah. level, ideally. So the complementarity regime in the International Criminal Court says that only if a state is unwilling or unable does the court get it. I think overall that to me is preferable from the primacy that we saw with the ad hoc war crimes yes. tribunals, where we said, look, if we want the case, we'll take it up to The Hague for the International Criminal Court for the former Yugoslavia. And primacy is not good if you don't have the resources to adjudicate all the cases mm -hmm. or if there are alternatives that are closer to where the crime is that could have a greater impact on victims, on national rule of law, mm -hmm. and so forth. So that's just an example of where I think the idea that we should take everything up to the international level is not necessarily the, the best solution. Actually, we had the conversation with Mr. Ocampo in the context of this uh, series, and, and one of the uh, points of, of discussion had to do with the fact that it seems that most of the customers of the ICC are coming from developing countries, partly because in these countries the uh, the structure for having these people being prosecuted doesn't exist. So, and, and, and I guess that in the public opinion, there is a perception of lack of balance. Right. So how do we, since you are talking about the ICC, right. how do we address this, uh, right. this and, problem? And I think that was an unexpected uh, turn of events. But it's a real issue. And it's a real issue. And that's why I support Pro uh, Prosecutor Ocampo's notion of positive complementarity. That is, the, what the statute did not anticipate is the need for somebody, if it's not the court, for some institution, to provide assistance to states that, for example, want to prosecute but don't have the resources or the capable courts or the judges, uh, et cetera. Uh, that is, Ocampo, I know, supports the idea that in the best of worlds, he should have no business. Yes. That is, in the best of worlds, states shouldn't be dumping their hot potatoes on the court because it cannot handle it. But what is lacking, and he's quite right, is mechanisms to provide for that to happen. That is, uh, the, the International Criminal Court is just a court. Yes. It is not a mechanism for rule of law assistance mm -hmm. uh, to enable complementarity or positive complementarity to take effect. So based on now these 10 years of experience, following up on this issue of the, of the ICC, I mean, now that we, we know these things, do we have ways through which we could somehow 
uh, rectify course a little bit or is it too late? Well, it's hard, but of course we have the lessons of other institutions that have changed and adapted to changing needs. So, for example, the World Health Organization mm -hmm. used to be a, a, an organization that avoided any kind of regulation or law, uh, but now that has changed a bit with SARS and other problems. Yeah. Uh, then the World Health Organization has realized that it needs to have a, a little bit more legalistic approach to international health crises. And so that's an, an organization that has adapted a bit itself without changing its constitution, yes. but adapting it, its, uh, its own activities. A court is harder to change. Why is it harder to change? Because I think that the institutions of the International Criminal Court are designed to do one thing and one thing only, which is prosecute someone when you have jurisdiction and lead it all the way to conclusion. It has a second mandate, which is to uh, try to assist the victims through some forms of compensation. But even that, we don't know if it can accomplish that because it's not clear how easy it will be to handle millions of victims demanding compensation or where the resources would ever be for that, yes. even assuming the court were to order uh, awards of damages. So that the court has a very limited mandate. And in the absence of the assembly of state parties of the International Criminal Court acting in pretty far-reaching ways to adapt new institutions or for some other organization to step in to fulfill the needs of, say, positive complementarity, it's harder to imagine how the court can create itself as a, a sister of states. So it's, it's a... It's a hard problem. It's, it's a difficult, and there is no provision uh, to really uh, engineer uh, changes uh, for the court in, right. in, in, the, in the statute. Well, through the so assembly on. of state parties, you can amend, but, but what I think what was foreseen is adding a new crime, yes. right? Mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of changes. And of course, the number of parties makes it a big Very success yeah. in but one yeah. sense, but, but it makes it harder to change. Of, yes, absolutely. That's right. That's yes. right. So, so you know, since you have dedicated part of your life and part of your scholarship uh, on international organizations, one would assume that you see international organizations uh, es essentially in positive terms. But in fact, in your book, uh, you, you, you tell us, uh, you, you give us uh, a more balanced picture. On the one hand, you, of course, highlight the positive dimensions of international organizations, but you also caution us against uh, the dark side, if you right. will, of, of, of international organizations. So tell us a bit about this kind of... Uh, sure. Uh, one of, the people, identity. one of the people that I cite in the book is, and I've already mentioned his name, Bob Cohane, a leading political scientist, and he has a, a quotation that I cite in the book, that the study of international organizations should never ever be confused with their celebration. Yes. That is, if we are an honest scholar, you look at whatever the phenomenon is without blinkers and try to appreciate the pros and cons, because only then are you credible and only then are you in a position to perhaps provide prescriptions for change. So in the book, I describe, and this is not terribly original, what I call the horizontal, the vertical, uh, and the ideological critiques of these organizations. And on the horizontal level, it's the accusation that even though these organizations, like the UN itself, are premised on sovereign equality, they don't really respect it. That is, of course, Every state is equal, but they're not on the Security Council, mm -hmm. are they? And I think that the more we look at what happens even in international courts, where there's a proposition of equality of arms, we know that the richer states are likely to be better legally advised, and that the level field, the uh, playing field is not quite as level as the lawyers pretend to be. So that's a horizontal inequity. And, and do you think that greater equality uh, would be a plus? Yes, overall. Overall. That is, if, if we believe that states should be treated, at least by the law, uh, on an equal basis, and I do believe that, certainly it should be true in a court of law, uh, then I think we should strive for sovereign equality, if at all possible. Now, but, but, but here I'm just going by the critique. So yes. there's a north-south perception that from the global south, I would say, 
that a lot of the organizations that we were very proud of, uh, from the World Bank to the IMF to the WTO uh, to the UN itself, that aspire to universal uh, participation are still tools of hegemonic mm -hmm. power. And so that's a, a horizontal. Then there is an equally difficult question, especially heard in the United States, but also elsewhere, of a vertical disconnect. That is, that what we have is law imposed from above that is very different in terms of the dem democratic legitimacy of law imposed from states themselves that grow out of democratic processes. Yes, treaties have to be approved at the national level, but we know that they tend to be dominated by the executive branch, for example. And so there's a perception that what happens in international organizations, like what happens in Las Vegas, stays in international <laughs> organizations. That is, they don't pervade domestically like they should because for one reason or another, they're not regarded as legitimate laws. Uh, or the national legislature decides to change something because that's their right. Mm -hmm. So there's a disconnect from the top down, which I call the vertical one. And then related to that is the ideological complaint. The sense that a lot of these organizations are pursuing ideology, whether it's cultural, economic, or other ideologies, that some states prefer over others. So that the, the most evident one is the notion held in the 1990s that the IMF was pursuing the Washington consensus approach to how you should govern yourselves, so that, um, especially economically, so that it was a notion that what all of these organizations were pursuing was deregulation, protection of property, uh, and pretty much um, saying that governments would do better by doing less yeah. and letting the market rule. Mm -hmm. We have had some change of thought about that. So uh, Stiglitz at Columbia or Danny Roderick are now economists who are saying the Washington consensus is, the, uh, is precisely the wrong approach, that there is no single model for economic development. There are many ways to get there, and that we were wrong in some of these institutions to push for, say, structural adjustment conditions which pursued one model. That's an example of an mm -hmm. ideological mm -hmm. critique. W what about the, the lack of uh, uh, normative or cultural universality uh, uh, from which uh, international organizations suffer? I mean, I spent quite a bit of time professionally in Asia, and I, I, and I came to realize that, in a way, international organizations are very much a Western uh, agenda uh, and uh, a Western creation. And it's essentially a dialogue between the Americans and the Europeans, and it certainly doesn't reflect uh, you know, the old world, and therefore it's a bit of a truncated universality. Right. And of course, there are, I think, legitimate and less legitimate approaches to that argument. Uh, the less legitimate ones, I think, have, I have seen in, say, so-called cultural relativism yeah. when it comes to basic human rights. And there, what I have seen is perhaps some Asian governments um, trotting out this idea in order to defend authoritarian mm -hmm. Asian values, right? I think that's not as legitimate. However, I do agree with the proposition that much of international law, including international organizations, is a Western construct. Absolutely. And that, in fact, much of the struggle post-decolonization is to try to adapt structures that were formed at the time when, say, the U.S., Russia, uh, Britain, and France we're basically drafting these instruments to a world in which those are not necessarily the dominant powers or shouldn't be. So I do think that this is an ongoing project to try to make these organizations, not just the UN system, but all of them more representative. The most current example is, I think it's a scandal that the IMF and, and the World Bank should be ruled only by Europeans yes. and Americans. Uh, I think that's an outrage. Now, there is no international law rule about how you propose the presidents mm -hmm. to be as diverse as the membership. But I think that that's just one example of how biased, if you want, uh, these organizations have been 
Um, so I do agree with at least yeah. those kinds of critiques. And, and now that we are uh, witnessing, the, we are told the rise of China and other uh, countries, I mean, do you feel that there is a chance that somehow the, 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 the nature uh, and, the, the, and the functions of, of international organizations and for that matter of international law is going to be uh, changing? Do you think that we're going to practice international law differently? Do you think that the, the sc we were talking earlier before uh, taping this conversation on uh, the, the global law program that we have at NYU, I mean, because one would think that there is a need to somehow internationalize international law. Absolutely. So do you feel that it is in the cards? Absolutely. Well, I hope it's in the cards, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a, a huge uh, struggle uh, because of language constraints and resource constraints. So an institution, even one as well, relatively well off as NYU, finds it hard to bring the world to New York, um, at least uh, until we start using more of the resources of the web, video yes. conferencing, et cetera. And we're located in one of the world's most cosmopolitan cities. So if it's difficult for NYU, imagine a school located in uh, Kuala Lumpur or, or in Iowa um, in, in the United States that finds it harder to break out of its local region. So this is a, this is a struggle of resources, but it's also an attitudinal notion. It's a mind. It's a mind mm. conception that we need this. Yes. Now it used to be that people studied the uh, what I would call the comparative study of international law. Mm -hmm. That is how international law was received in different countries was a legitimate and very deep source of study by people like Eric Stein, mm -hmm. who actually looked at, well, how was international law incorporated in a place like this country versus this country? And I think that, sadly, we don't have as much of that going on as we used to, in part because the international law has expanded, it's become a curriculum. Mm -hmm. And so we're also focused on the expanding WTO regime that fewer people focused on how is that regime implemented around the world? And I think that if we actually took a much closer look, we would find that there is no one trade regime. There are many mm -hmm. trade mm -hmm. regimes. Yes. Different countries have different approaches to what the World Bank would call corruption and mm -hmm. what it means, or what it means to have non-discrimination, most favored nation treatment, all those things. Yeah. So that I think that we pretend that there is a single treaty yeah. text, but when we look closer, you will see some of these cultural so, changes. So in, in essence, you are telling us, Professor, uh, Professor Alvarez, is that not only that uh, the, the law uh, which we, we teach is not the law which in fact exists, and it's not the law that perhaps we should be teaching. Right. Well, but it's also more complicated than that. I just gave a talk at Edinburgh on international law as national law. And it was a conference on trickle-down. The idea is we need to study how international law trickles down into different national legal orders. And of course, we're not just talking about international organizations, but everything yeah. else. And what I tried to suggest at that conference is we, we should also be interested in trickle-up. That is, each country's adaptation of international law may influence international law itself especially if the country is powerful enough to exert its yeah. view like the United States. Yeah. So th I think that the United States has exerted its own views on the use of force post 9-11 so that we do have at least two uh, Security Council resolutions that sort of suggest that it's perfectly okay to go to war in Afghanistan uh, and it's okay to go to war if you've suffered an armed attack by a non-state actor, and that it's okay mm -hmm. to go after the country in which that non-state actor acted and committed the terrorist act if the state acquiesced yes. in that. Mm -hmm. All of those are arguably new rules on the use of force, arguably endorsed by the Security Council's recognition that, say, post-Afghanistan, uh, use of force is permitted, as it said in at least Resolution 1325, 73, I'm sorry. Um, so therefore, that's an example of national law or national views affecting international, trickle up, in uh, my yes. view. And, and I think, that, uh, as a matter of fact, the, 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 the generic problem uh, which you have been pointing out of saying these things, that 
it's about the relationship between power and principles. I mean, ideally, you would want to have principles, assuming that these uh, principles are the right ones, being put at the service of power. Right. But very often, it's the other way around. So right. how do we uh, you know, envision organizations, law in such a way that, first of all, we're able, we're in the position to identify the right principles, and second of all, we have power being put at the service of his principles. Right. How do we go about this? Well, that's a it's tricky a, one. Yes. I wish I had the solution yes. to that one. Because that's, that's how we can connect law and justice in right. the end. Right, right. And, and the, the connection is, is quite complicated. And of course, you're now, we're now in an office occupied by Tom Frank, yes. who devoted his life to uh, legitimacy uh, and, and questions of fairness and justice. And um, Tom first approached it, as you well know, as a problem of legal legitimacy and said that fairness had to be left for a second day. And then he tackled fairness. And that one was a much more difficult proposition because when we tackle fairness, I think we need to bring people other than lawyers into the room. So you, you need to bring philosophers, Right, and you need to, uh, and you bring to bring anthropologists and economists because I do think that the world we're living in, in part thanks to lawyers, is a world where what we define to be the good life is no longer restricted to the respect for civil and political rights of the first covenant. Mm -hmm. Now we increasingly recognize, perhaps not the United States that hasn't ratified the economic, social, and cultural yeah. covenant, but that these two rights are indivisible and at, at least at the level of, of legitimacy have to be connected. How we achieve the economic welfare and not just the civil and political rights of people has to be a broader political project and not just a legal one. No, precisely. You know, the, the title of one of your, of, your, of your books is International Organizations as Lawmakers. And, and if we're going to be true to the idea of lawmaking, you know, we, we have to somehow open up the gates and bring to the table more than lawyers. Mm -hmm. and, and would you say that this agenda is one of the key agendas uh, uh, of the future? Because well, I do think that one of the things you, we started to talk about is what era are we in with respect to international organizations? And if we just look at international organizations, I would define one of the characteristics of this era as the accountability era, where we're now thinking what I would call second generation questions about these organizations. Now that we know the criticisms of these organizations, how do we engage in trying to fix them one of them is to open them up beyond states to, and of course we now have amicus briefs being accepted in say ICSID tribunals more often. We have efforts to open up even the sacred realm of the Security Council yes. through greater transparency, but we have a long ways to go. Most of, the, of what the IMF does is still quite secret. Uh, that is, we still have a long way to go in an institution say like the IMF where most of the resources are located in the rich, most of the folks that, are recipi that receive the resources are in the global south. Yes. And of course, because it's a bank and the folks who control the resources control the policies, it's hard to change our mindset to think that some of the recipients should be very much related to how the bank is governed. And that's a struggle. And, and to be fair, the IMF is looking more closely at its voting rights yes. and yes. trying to increase, say, the votes of Brazil or in India. Um, but that's just starting the point. Ye yes, because in fact, you know, don't you think that all these uh, new elements which are not part of the picture are going to force us, if we want to have law being true to the demands of justice, to rethink the idea of, of, of lawmaking? I mean, you know, up to now, we, were, we, we could afford to be, uh, to, to be uh, thinking and acting under the illusion that the Western law was the all of law, right. uh, that somehow uh, you know, uh, the Western view was the all of law. It's less and less possible. So right. wouldn't you say that somehow we have to revisit what it is? Right. And I, do think that, and, and I do think that's why um, your original question about governance is relevant. Once we start talking about governance, and once we start take, uh, talking seriously about, say, the title of my book, International Organizations as Lawmakers, we're already out of the European-American positivist mindset that says all law has to fit 
those old wine bottles of Article 38 of the Statute of the International Criminal uh, of, the, of, the, of the Court of Justice, that is, uh, treaties, custom, general principles, and that if it's not one of those three things, it isn't legally relevant. Yeah. And my whole book uh, is premised on the fact that, yes, the Article 38 sources are important, and you could try to fit everything into these, but that increasingly, if you do, you will miss a yeah. great part of the picture that how businesses are run, how people's lives are dictated, are often now being uh, at least affected by things that don't quite look like treaties or, or custom so, or general. So, so you, you, you want an opening up of the sources of law. Right. And that, in fact, some people had problems with the, the very concept of my book. That is, uh, of course, international organizations are not lawmakers. It's the states. And they are merely the agents of states. And you disagree with this? And I think that, um, of course, states are, as I say, the, remain the principal lawmaking actors. There's no question about that. In fact, I just gave another talk that I'll give you a copy of, The Return of the State, suggesting that in many areas, including foreign investment law, the, state, the states themselves are trying to reassert themselves, to regain policy states, a policy uh, space. Yes. Uh, now, the proper title, however, should be the return of some states. Some states, <laughs> That yes. is, that some states remain more powerful than others and are able to influence the law more than others, including, of course, the United mm -hmm. States. Um, so I do think that states remain the most powerful actors. But I do think that international organizations, for just to cite one example, have a relative autonomous aspect to their activities. And that we cannot wholly control them. Even the United States cannot prevent, say, the General Assembly from voting Palestine to be a state, if that I, should I, happen, I, I, right? I think it will. <laughs> right? But see, that's, that, and that's my yeah. point. That is, that the collectivity of states, or at least the collectivity of what's the dominant number of states in the General Assembly, can sometimes have normative effects, both good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't want to prejudice or prejudge uh, the idea that just because states act as a collective, it's always progressive, okay? Yes. Because I, I'm fond of, of saying, look, mm -hmm. I have a teenager, mm -hmm. and when teenagers get together, um, it could be good or bad. Yes. <laughs> yes. So a bunch of, of, of randy teenagers can do bad things. A, a, a bunch of, of bad states, especially badly run states, yeah. authoritarian states, can do bad things. So I'm, I'm agnostic as to whether always collectivities can do good things uh, or, should, or yeah. should be expected to do good yeah. things. So all these questions are really big questions and they, they have to do with, uh, with the reform of the international system, the reform of, the, of international institutions. Are you, are you happy, are you comfortable with the nature of the debates uh, taking place on, on the reform uh, of the international system, of international institutions? No, I think the debates are still relatively narrow. Mm -hmm. I think that for example, um, the Security Council. We have been talking about reforming the Security Council for decades. Yeah. Uh, few people really have any hopes of, uh, of a, a deep reform or even perhaps even a slight reform. That is what we're talking about, Plan A or B by the Secretary General as to whether it'll have 25 mm -hmm. uh, states and, uh, and who holds the veto and so forth. Whereas the conversation might be more expansive about what kind of collective security arm do we really want, what should be the relationship between the Security Council and, say, regional organizations. Um, is there such a thing as uh, some notion of responsibility to protect where uh, some things will invariably lead to intervention uh, by the Security Council? And most of those conversations are yeah. not really mm -hmm. taking place because we're still, uh, we're still debating who has the veto. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So n things are not really moving ahead. Uh. No, and, and I would think that some of this you can blame international lawyers for. That is, international lawyers uh, tend to have narrow views of what should be relevant to the discussion. And sometimes international lawyers are as guilty as anybody else of saying some things are sacred and should not be touched. For example, the uh, International Court of Justice. Yes. 
most international lawyers say it's a wonderful thing and that it's one of the best operating things we have. But the truth is, it just continues on with a relatively small docket of cases mm -hmm. and increasingly has to deal with very fact-specific cases. And yet it operates as an appellate court where the judges rarely engage with the facts. Um, and I'm not just picking on that court. It could be lots of other international tribunals. In fact, there's a whole book published on, on the international criminal courts mm -hmm. by Nancy Combs in which she basically suggests that they wouldn't know how to engage in facts if you gave it to them. Yes. Uh, and so I think uh, international lawyers are as guilty as anybody else of saying what we've created uh, should not be examined. But, but in fact, what you are uh, alluding to here is the difficulty for, for international law, for international lawyers to, to, to conceptualize and, and, and bring about change. It seems that it's very difficult. Perhaps it's easier for U.S. international lawyers than, than it is for European international lawyers. But it's very difficult for international law to really right. think about change. Right. And well, I how think, do you explain that? Well, I think partly it, uh, remember, uh, much of international law has expanded in relatively recent times. That is, on, on, in a historical sense. Some of the people who were uh, alive at the creation of the U.N. are still alive. So it's really a short space of time. So it, many of them perceive themselves as having been victorious against state power, mm -hmm. having achieved these great institutions for the collective will, whether it's the UN, the ICJ, more recently the International Criminal Court. And therefore, it's hard to be critical of your own institutional mm -hmm. efforts mm -hmm. um, in that short amount of time. Uh, these are our babies, uh, mm -hmm. right? And we don't tend to criticize our own, our own children. Yeah. Be because more often than not, I mean, you know, if it were not for diplomats, for decision makers, law, I mean, uh, change in the field of law would not happen. I mean, uh, all these changes in the field of international law in the 90s happened out of uh, diplomatic activism, uh, the, uh, uh, decision makers uh, activism, but not necessarily, and, and, and international lawyers accompanied right. this movement. Right, and, and I do think that there's something to the idea that sometimes change or change in how we think about these things happens when we're exposed to another discipline. So that's why I actually applaud yeah. uh, interdisciplinary efforts be between, say, political scientists and lawyers, because I think those collaborations will enrich both sides. Yes. The politicians will realize that law exists and can be made to matter, but the lawyers realize that what they're doing as law is politics in another disguise. Yeah. What about philosophy and law? The same. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think that one of the positive things, if I can say that, about the American Legal Academy is that, for example, uh, this school and man many others values very highly somebody who has a PhD in philosophy mm -hmm. or in economics or in some other field and then comes to law or vice versa, that yes. is, f uh, first law and then the other field. Uh, more than somebody who has a Ph.D. in law itself. Mm -hmm. So that we tend to hire uh, more interdisciplinarians than I think, say, Europeans do. Yes, absolutely. For their law school no, teaching. No, 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 absolutely. Changing a bit uh, the, 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 the topic, I mean, I, I noticed uh, uh, in, your, in your bio that you're about to publish uh, two new books dealing with the uh, international investment regime. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in a way, this is not a new interest for you because I think that uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, you started uh, your, your career working uh, uh, on these issues, both as a, as a legal scholar, but also as a, pra as a, as a practitioner. So simple question, why is it that you are returning to these issues? And, and why is it that I guess you feel that these issues are particularly important today? Well, I think that the foreign investment regime interests me because it's one of the most active in terms of producing uh, law, not just uh, 3,000 now bilateral investment treaties and free trade agreements, but investor state arbitrations are booming. That is, we have lots of awards. So there's more to do, more law to look at. But beyond that, what I like about it is that it's a regime that ra right now stresses uh, in very highlighted form all those vertical, horizontal, and ideological yes. issues in one neat place. And ironically, it's a, it's a regime 
where the United States is very actively engaged, including in international dispute settlement. As you know, the United States is not party to many international courts and rarely uh, permits supranational uh, supervision over its laws. But in NAFTA, that's a big exception. The U.S. is one of the leading respondent states. And therefore, it's an example of the U.S. now being subject to an international courts or courts scrutiny through arbitration mechanisms, but not having control over those claims because they're brought by investors. And the result is what I call buyer's remorse. The United States is now having second thoughts about this regime, which it once foisted on the world, including the idea of Washington consensus, yes. and now is backtracking in its more recent bids from these investor protections and trying to restore more policy mm -hmm. space for itself. So it's a perfect example of, of a regime that has encountered challenges, is undergoing change, and happens to involve a leading economic player. So the, the field as it is now is, is uh, very, very different from what the field was uh, 20 years ago. Absolutely. So, uh, there's much more law to discuss, yeah. for example, uh, than there was. Uh, but there's also institutions as well. So what people think about the investment regime, they think of these bilateral treaties. But the fact is that the uh, IMF is an investment regulator, and there are lots of other market regulators as well. So that when a state violates one of these treaties or doesn't or has an expropriation or doesn't uh, abide by one of its arbitral awards, market players may influence the result. So you are building on your uh, uh, established expertise, but you're also expanding your expertise out of all these changes uh, which have taken place in the past 20 years. Well, and I would say that this is an example of governance, right, uh, without government and without a single international organization dominating it, mm -hmm. which is fascinating to me. We have the WTO, yeah. but we don't have the equivalent of a WTO for foreign investment. And yet, I would mm -hmm. submit that we still have governance in international mm -hmm. investment law. Okay, but, but all this assumes that uh, legal regimes are, 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 are self-contained, that it is possible for them to continue to work out uh, in a self-contained fashion, but I mean, in a world which is more and more globalized, more and more inter interdependent, is it the right assumption? Probably right. not. No, no. And I, I'm, I agree with Bruno Sema, who says that most of these regimes are probably not self-contained. Yeah. And of course, we do have many rules in international law which enable, say, an investor state arbitrator to draw from general public international law. So the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties itself says you can refer to relevant rules of international law among the parties, and not just the bilateral investment treaty. So Bruno Sema has argued that, for example, this is a recipe by which we can bring human rights issues into an investor state arbitration. And I can see that happening. But my problem is that unless you change the investor state arbitral system itself Thanks. by changing, say, who the arbitrators are, who can bring cases, what the standing of other people who are interested is in the case. Unless you change all of those things, I'm not sure we would like the human rights conclusions formed by commercial arbitrators in resolving commercial disputes. But do you think that uh, it is likely to happen, this kind of, uh, of changes? And, and, and one would assume that it is necessary to really have these changes in take, taking place in order to have global governance being uh, you know, uh, more effi effective, more efficient. Uh, well, I think I mentioned earlier Rudy Titel's and Rob House's view yeah. that, the, uh, that there are commonalities that they see among these international adjudicators, whether it's in trade, investment, or international criminal courts, where they all reach for human rights values, and they call it humanities law. Mm -hmm. um, I am not as optimistic as they are because I do think that the background of arbitrators or judges matter. And I don't think that the background of, say, a judge on the ICJ or a judge on the European Court of Human Rights is the same as, mm -hmm. the, as the background or training of, say, an arbitrator in one of these investors. So, so all of these people are the captive of their own legal training and, I do and they don't see beyond it. And I think this has been captured beautifully in the scholarship of David Kennedy, who says that what we have, and he, this is a way he uses 
to criticize international law is we have the dominance of expertise. And the dominance of expertise is, as you described it, discrete experts focusing on only particular ways of looking at things and less a holistic yes. approach. And so uh, he's very critical of that, and he thinks that that's actually the reliance on expertise is increasing, mm. not decreasing. So if that's the case, we can look forward to more fragmentation yes. and not the humanities law that Rudy Titel and Rob House foresee. And, and when they talk about uh, humanities laws, do they talk about the humanity, or do they talk, I mean, you know, the, the, the humankind, or do they talk about humanities? Uh, I think they have both. in mind, and well, I think they have in mind, the, I think uh, they have in mind the common human rights heritage okay. of, say, the covenants, mm -hmm. um, for whatever it's worth. If you think that those are universal, fine. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you think that they're still skewed because of the European heritage of international law, then you may not be satisfied with that answer. Because, you know, the, this argument could be in favor of bringing more philosophy into law. Right, right. I don't think that's quite that's what, what, they, they, have that's what they mean. Right. Uh, you are also currently serving as a special advisor to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, uh, and this on a pro bono fashion. So, uh, what is your role in this function, and why did you decide to, to take this additional uh, responsibility? Well, I couldn't resist. Uh, 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 Moreno Campo is a very persuasive guy, but, uh, and he has other advisors. He has Catherine McKinnon, for example, on gender, and Juan Mendez on humanitarian yeah. issues. And so when he asked me to do uh, some consulting for him and advise him uh, on public international law, it was hard to say no. But uh, what it does, what, what the job means is whatever uh, the prosecutor uh, wants me to do. So for example, um, uh, the Assembly of State Parties recently uh, addressed the question of an oversight mechanism uh, for the court that would be capable of, for example, uh, looking into accountability issues, I including inside the prosecutor's office. And um, uh, the prosecutor asked me to take a look at the proposal. And what I found was that there is some problems here with the idea of a assembly of state parties mechanism being able to go over his head directly to staff members to investigate them. Uh, when we went to so much trouble to create an independent prosecutor that would be independent of political uh, action. Because, of course, there's the possibility that some of these investigations would be politically motivated. As we see, the, what the court does may not be popular with some states, including some members of the Assembly of State Parties. And therefore, I thought that that was problematic. But what I find interesting about it is that it engages what I have just described as the second generation issues. Mm -hmm. That is, now that we have these international organizations, including courts in place, and some of them for some time, we now have to find make them accountable. We have to make them responsible. We have to respond to NGOs and other people's complaints about their legitimacy. And to be truthful, most international lawyers mm -hmm. have not given that much thought to how you make UN peacekeepers accountable, yes. mm -hmm. or how do you make uh, the UN accountable itself? Now, we do have this effort by the International Law Commission on articles of I.O. responsibility uh, that uh, they've just released. I, it's no secret I'm very critical of those articles because I don't think you can wave a magic wand and resolve this through this positive idea mm -hmm. that, oh, an international organization is a legal person, just like a state is a legal person. Therefore, we take the Articles of State Responsibility and we replace the word state with I.O. and we get the rules of responsibility for an organization. The truth is, as the International Court of Justice told us, is that each international organization is a creature of its own charter. It is a legal person only in so far as those characteristics are needed to fulfill its functions. Mm -hmm. So the personhood of the IMF or the OECD or the OAS may be different than the personhood or the responsibilities of the UN. Mm -hmm. And therefore, these are hard issues 
that I think have to be resolved organization by organization. Sometimes accountability may mean court-ordered accountability. Sometimes it could mean ombudsman approaches. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it could mean creating other bodies within the organization that can check the action of the other or second guess it. To some extent, the General Assembly criticizing the Security Council yeah. uh, or the ICJ, if it ever dared, actually engaging in judicial review of the, uh, of, of the council, uh, of the council yeah. or of yes. uh, uh, the organization. Um, those are different ways, and I'm not going to prejudge which one, mm -hmm. but I think that the modern era that we're in is very much about making sure that these organizations are accountable. And, and, and so far, uh, this notion hasn't really been on the map. No. And, 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 and if we continue to ignore this, this, uh, the demands of accountability, you, you feel that the, the, the legitimacy of, of this organization will be all the more in question. Right. And for example, I think that we have tended to ignore questions of potential for conflicts of interest, ethical responsibilities and rules about them for our international judges or arbitrators. Uh, we, of course, have rules about conflict of interest when it comes to national judges and that they can't be on cases that they have resolved. And we have rules governing how lawyers should behave, including with respect to professional responsibility. We have very little attention paid to all of that. Uh, and those are accountability and legitimacy issues that I think we have to pay attention to, not just for investor state arbitrators, but for the ICJ, for the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, for the judges in the, uh, in the court. For example, I think there's been a recent book by uh, Philippe Sands and others on, on how international judges are selected. And it turns out that it's very political, yes, 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 right? Yes. And so... It's one of those exercises, don't look behind the curtain because you don't want to see what's there. We like to pretend that our judges, including on the International Court of Justice, are selected at a purely uh, meritorious basis. Which is not the case. It is not the case. They yes. have to campaign for this. There are regional yes. blocks, uh, and, and they have to get that. And it's not necessarily the but, case uh, that we get the best judges. Yeah. But the same applies to heads of international organizations. The same. The same and some of similar issues, but of course, uh, the, although it's more obvious in the case of who is the head of the IMF or the World Bank, it's a little less obvious mm -hmm. that maybe these judges that we extol so much uh, and have degrees and so forth may not be as qualified as others, mm -hmm. right? So I think those are issues that we have to examine, and that means being critical of these organizations. That's why I don't want to just celebrate yeah. them. And, and why is it that uh, this notion of accountability is so much now on the map? Why is it that we're talking so much about this? Well, the, the, the folks who study global administrative law yeah. would tell you, look, mm -hmm. the more uh, a, an entity engages in global administrative law, that is, regulates others, the mm -hmm. more it is subject to what global administrative law says, which is transparency, mm -hmm. accountability. You can't be a, uh, a, an administrator in the United States, for example, in, say, EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, without expecting Congress to ask you questions, without yes. expecting all of these issues of accountability and responsibility. Um, the same with any agency action in the United States has to go through a notice and comment period where the public has to approve. Well, to the extent some of these organizations are now engaging in administrative regulation, why shouldn't they have notice well, and comment? Yes. Why shouldn't they be insist? Why shouldn't we insist that when they issue a uh, a guideline or a soft law that we know ha will have legal effect, that they have to explain their position, reason it out, and also have participation of global civil society yeah. and others? So the more they get involved in regulating the world, the more they end they up have being be the, 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 the object of, of scrutinization. That's right. That's right. So, so perhaps as a way to, to end our, our conversation, a question on, on, on the future. I know that you don't have a crystal ball. You told me that uh, mm -hmm. you, you weren't comfortable talking about uh, how the world will, will look like in 50 years from now. But let's try a little bit as a way to, sure. uh, you, know, you know, in your view, I mean, how do you, 
how do you see international organizations in, in 20 years from now, 30 years from now? I mean, uh, will, they, will they be more important, less important? And, and what, what will be their relationship with, uh, with other international actors, the nation state, NGOs, uh, the G20? You, you said that uh, one of the specificities of the time in which we live now is that international organizations and nation states are not the only actors. In fact, there is a proliferation of actors. So right. how do you see the future? Well, uh, well, it, it's a tough one, right? But I think there are some indications that, uh, of some of the changes that might be afoot. That is, I think we have uh, now created a world where we're demanding almost too much from states by way of international uh, regulata regulation overload. For example, the, U uh, the UN human rights system alone demands so many reports from so many different bodies of, of, of a single state. Uh, and that if it overburdens a state with resources like the United States, you can only imagine a state that has fewer lawyers or fewer resources. That, and so that information overload or information demand, I should say, uh, against states will, I suspect, lead at some point, or I hope it does, to some consolidation. Uh, and so I would expect perhaps fewer subparts of organizations uh, including in human rights, uh, at some point in the di in, in the future, some consolidation. So, in some respects, perhaps fewer organizations, or at least organizational demands, on the numbers of states, which well will go up. But there is a certain natural limit to how many states we could possibly have. I also expect some delegation to regional groups. Uh, or regional entities, not just the G20, but the OAS or others, will, I think, necessarily be expected to take on more things. Um, and this is a, a result of, in part, maybe a response to the region should have more control over regional affairs. Maybe it's a response to your trans-civilizational perspective yes. that may be one way of responding to this idea that law looks different in different parts of the world, and maybe we should li let it be yeah. different. So consolidation, delegation, and also somehow uh, diversification, perhaps? Uh, well, that too. I do think we're in a mode where we can continue to have more international adjudication. And I see more, not less, experimentation with different forms of it. So if I look at the international criminal law system, for example, I see more experimentation over time. So from, from nothing uh, that we had for many, many years, we went to two ad hoc tribunals with primacy. Then we started experimenting with hybrid tribunals. Mm -hmm. uh, and hybrid tribunals that look different from one another. Then you had the Lebanon tribunals. Yes that is not quite the same because it has a lot of national law involved. Then we have uh, the idea that it's not just tribunals, but truth commissions should be working alongside because we realize that courts cannot do everything and that some things need not go to court. And maybe the South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission approach was not such a bad idea. And then, of course, we still have, now we have for a number of years, the International Criminal Court. But I think it's increasingly clear that that court cannot handle every issue of mass atrocity <laughs> in the planet. And so I think it'll, only, it'll continue to be one among other actors in this area. So to that extent, even though I've predicted consolidation in some areas, in this area, we may have proliferation, proliferation uh, yeah. continued proliferation, uh, and, and that would be just one model of proliferation within one international criminal law. But then you see, uh, I don't think we'll see a consolidation between the trade and investment regimes, so you still see continued uh, fragmentation there, and possibly even additional fragmentation with, say, even within the investment regime, where you may have uh, South America deciding on a regional body to resolve regional investment disputes, um, perhaps with an appellate body um, that isn't feasible in some other, uh, in, say, ICSID, uh, because that's at the global level. Yeah. So I do think that we're going to see more experimentation. 
with the risks of fragmentation. So the, the, the future is relatively, of course, open. Yes. So perhaps as, as a final question, what are the things on which you are working now and which are going to be part of your uh, intellectual agenda for the, for, the coming, uh, for the coming years? Well, one of the plans I have is to deliver a series of lectures in Xiamen, uh, China. They have an academy mm -hmm. um, uh, in Xiamen. And what they've asked me to talk about in 2013 will be international organizations. So I'll be returning to the topic of the book. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I accept it is because I want to do a second edition of the book. Uh, because I think that even a book that was published in 2006 uh, is now out of date oh, really? in some respects. Well, in some yeah. respects, because I do think that uh, the book does not do enough with respect to the World Health Organization, uh, with some of the more innovative approaches that the International Labor Organization is doing. And, of course, all these issues of accountability and responsibility, uh, many of them at least, have come up since the book was published so that it would be an excuse to get back into international organizations to revisit some of the themes of the yeah. book in light of recent events. The other area that I think I'll be more involved in, and it should be obvious from my remarks, is international dispute settlement yes. in courts mm -hmm. and how courts relate to each other, what makes them tick, what makes them legitimate, how judges are selected, the fragmentation issues that they present.